I am Liz Niemer. I am the Program and Communications Coordinator here at Twin Cities Diversity in Practice, and I am assuming you are all here um, to learn more about our Twin Cities Diversity in Practice 1L Clerkship Program. Um, for this webinar, I'm going to go ahead and start with um, a brief uh, overview of the Twin Cities Diversity in Practice 1L Clerkship Program. Um, and then we'll move into a question and answer session with all of our fantastic um, alumni panelists. Um, uh, if you have any questions while I am presenting uh, the PowerPoint, please do feel free to put those in either the chat or the Q&A. Um, and of course, we will be opening up to questions at the end. Um, we are also recording this session and uh, we will be posting it to our YouTube channel as well. Um, it is... Uh, 901. Um, so I am going to go ahead and get started with the presentation. So Twin Cities Diversity in Practice, um, we are a nonprofit organization of now 70 law firms and corporate legal departments here in the Twin Cities. Um, all of these law firms and corporate legal departments are working together to create a vibrant and inclusive uh, legal community here in the Twin Cities. Um, and our mission is to attract, recruit, advance and retain attorneys of color here in Minnesota. Um, this is just a brief snapshot of many of our member law firms. Um, it includes, you know, large firms, small firms, and uh, many in between, um, some, you know, large firms with an office here, some that are headquartered here, um, but it's really a testament to how um, the legal community is committed to um, diversity inclusion here in the Twin Cities. And of course, we also have support from the corporate legal departments as well, um, which is another fantastic addition to Twin Cities diversity in practice. Um, a little bit about the Twin Cities diversity in practice 1L clerkship program. It has been um, a standby program for over a decade now um, and has helped launch the career of law students of color in the Twin Cities. Um, it was created to strengthen and um, strengthen and diversify the legal talent pipeline um, with strategic partnerships between law firms and corporate legal departments. Um, and so this is one really great thing about the Twin Cities Diversity in Practice one up clerkship program is that um, when you are placed or when you are hired at a law firm, you will also be able to spend time at a corporate legal department. Um, and so you'll not only get some great private practice law firm experience, but you'll also see what it's like to work um, in-house at a corporate legal department, which is um, a pretty rare experience for law students. Um, some other great benefits of the Twin Cities Diversity in Practice 1L Clerkship Program include exposure to leadership. Um, this includes our board members who are always eager to meet 1L clerks and participate in our networking events, um, specific dedicated professional development events. Um, we put on some uh, professional development training specifically for our 1L clerks. Um, mentorship, we also match each clerk with a mentor that is outside of their organization. So you have someone um, to ask some of those uh, stickier questions. And of course, most of the law firms also do provide, um, of course, a mentor within their organization as well. And connections to alumni. We um, do always want to um, provide uh, those connections to people who have been in your shoes before because we know that they have a depth of knowledge. Again, uh, this uh, program was created to promote the Twin Cities legal community to 1L students of color from both Minnesota and across the country. Um, and we encourage students from racial and ethnic uh, groups that have been historically underrepresented in the legal profession to apply. Um, if you have any questions, um, you know, you, you can reach out to your career center, you can reach out to me, I will uh, put my email address in the chat. Um, but we were a resource here for you. Um, and if, yeah, if you have any questions about, you know, qualifying, we are absolutely happy to discuss that with you. I will say, um, you know, Twin Cities Diversity in Practice is, has been dedicated to um, uh, specifically racial and ethnic diversity in the legal profession um, for uh, its entirety as an organization. Um, and that is, you know, a founding principle of our mission. Sometimes we get uh, questions about that. Um, and that is the focus of our mission. Um, when you are putting together your application, because um, 
it will be read by a recruiting professional who doesn't know you. We do encourage people to talk about, you know, um, their life experiences and why they're applying to this program in particular. It just gives um, the recruiting professionals a little bit more insight into who you are um, and why you're applying um, specifically through the TCDIP 1L clerkship program. Um, and yes, uh, everybody, of course, is self-identifying as um, uh, when they're applying to this program. And uh, we do encourage people to be specific. You don't need to, you know, list all of, you know, various, you don't need to like make yourself entirely super vulnerable, but um, you do need to introduce yourself to the recruiting professionals and just let them know a little bit about you and why, uh, your story and why you're applying to the TCDIP 1L clerkship program. Um, uh, about how the Twin Cities Diversity Practice 1L clerks are recruited and hired. We promote the program um, to law schools, historically black colleges and universities, um, and uh, throughout the Midwest um, to recruit diverse candidates. That's hopefully how you guys found us. Um, law students directly apply to the law firms. And so all of the positions are listed on our website um, at diversityandpractice.org. Um, I'll put the website in the chat here as soon as I'm done with the PowerPoint. Um, but we have over 39 positions available this year. And so you, um, as a law student, will tailor your resume and cover letter um, for the positions individually that you want to apply to and submit them directly to the recruiting professionals at the law firms. Um, Twin Cities Diversity in Practice um, does not receive the applications. Um, and then the law firms are responsible for screening, selecting, and hiring the TCDIP 1L clerks um, in coordination with their corporate partner. So again, um, when you're hearing back um, about your application, you'll be hearing back directly from each individual law firm, um, not from Twin Cities Diversity Practice. Um, applications opened on November 16th, and um, we do encourage people to apply um, early. Um, applications are accepted on a rolling basis. I would say um, if you are in the application process currently to really try to get your application submitted by January 31st, if possible. Um, while again, most applications are expect accepted on a rolling basis, so there aren't specific deadlines. I'd say most law firms are working on their interview processes um, about uh, starting at about the end of January and really um, looking at those applications and Make, starting to make hiring decisions at that time. Um, yep, there's the website again. Um, I will again also put that in the chat as well. Um, and now we are ready to transition to our alumni panel portion. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask all of our alumni panels panelists to introduce themselves, um, starting with Mason Medeiros, if you want to just say, um, uh, your name, your law school, um, what uh, firm and organization you clerked at, um, and anything else you want to share about uh, your one off clerkship experience. Yeah, hi everybody. My name is Mason. Uh, I'm a 2L at the University of Minnesota Law School. And this past, last summer, I worked with Fagu Drinker and Intact Insurance, my corporate partner. Regarding my experience, I just wanted to say it was a really great experience. I think it's wonderful that both TCDIP is involved in this and as well as just the large number of firms in the Twin Cities being so dedicated to promoting diversity in the practice is really encouraging and is great to see after moving to the Twin Cities for the first time. Um, Casey. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Casey Stewart. I am a 2L at Vermont Law. Um, I uh, clerked with Mayor and Gear last year, and the corporate partner was Allianz Insurance. Um, I have a very unique story in how I ended up at Mayor and Gear, um, which I'm happy to share a little bit later, but the short of it is that um, some of those no's could possibly turn into a yes. Um, originally, Mayor and Gear had decided to go with a different intern, but that intern ended up getting their first choice. And so um, don't be discouraged when you get a no, sometimes things change. And so continue to always make yourself available because a no could just mean not yet. Uh, Stephanie. 
Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Stephanie Chen. I'm an associate at Robbins Kaplan. I my TC dip clerkship was with Fox Rothschild and the corporate partner was Ecolab. Um and I'm originally from out of state, so the TC dip program helped me inter get more introduced and acquainted with the Twin Cities legal community and so I've stayed ever since. Um, and I've also been on the hiring side of things, too, in terms of reviewing uh, one-hour clerkship applications and interviewing applicants. So I'm happy to talk a little bit and give some insights from that side as well. And Matthew. Oh, you're muted, I think. I've been having audio issues, so apparently two years into the pandemic, I still can't handle Zoom, uh, which maybe shows my my age on this this panel. Uh, but my name is Matthew Robinson. I'm a shareholder at Winthrop Weinstein in the commercial litigation group. Uh, it feels weird to say, but I did my TC Dip 1L clerkship a decade ago, back in 2011, at a firm that no longer exists called Fulbright and Jaworski, which is now part of the Norton Rose uh, con worldwide conglomerate. Uh, and the corporate partner was General Mills. Uh, wonderful experience. Um, I'm from the Twin Cities area. I was going to law school at Northwestern in Chicago and I reached out to TC Dip and said, you know, I'm a diverse attorney. I wanna come back home, you know, help me out. What can I do? And then the next day I had a bunch of interviews and, and kind of the rest is sort of history 10 years later, uh, commercial litigation shareholder. So there's a path. Great. Um, and so, of course, this is um, for all of those watching, all students, this is really your time. Um, and so if you have questions, I really do encourage you to put those in either the Q&A or the chat, um, since we have uh, myself and all of our panelists here to answer them. Um, but to get us started, I'll go ahead and ask a question of all of our panelists. Um, uh, what inspired you to apply to the TCDIP 1L clerkship program? Um, Mason, I'll go ahead and start with you. Yeah, so for me, I'd heard a lot about various diversity programs throughout the country when I was applying to law schools and really doing my research about where I wanted to attend. And once I was accepted into the University of Minnesota, the more I heard about the various diversity programs, TCDIP and also the HCBA diversity culture program, it really just encouraged me to apply. And I saw it as a great opportunity to get that experience at a, both a law firm and the corporate partner which to me was a very unique opportunity to see both sides because I wasn't entirely sure what type of law I wanted to go into or whether I wanted more of the private practice or with the corporate side. So having that opportunity in front of me to be able to explore both sides and just see where my interests lie and really what law I wanted to practice in is what really drove me to apply for it. Casey. Um, I applied to TC DIP. Um, from mentorship. Um, most of us here, if not all of us, are first generation in some sort, whether that's college um, or law school or for myself, both. And so I, I needed someone to hold my hand throughout this entire process. I think that it's scary and just kind of unreal to apply for a summer internship in November. Um, and so I had no, no reference of where to start. And so I wanted to be a part of a program who um, provided a lot of mentorship. Um, I wasn't just looking for a summer job. I wanted someone who would hold my hand throughout the two L, throughout my two L year and three L year and two L summer and so on and so forth. And so um, after I had started to do my research about TC Dip and I heard about just how they were trying to not just leverage, but close the gap for minority students and BIPOC students, because we have different acts. You know, we hear about those horror stories of minority attorneys not having meaningful work. So work may be comparable to that of a paralegal or a legal assistant, but not getting those opportunities to go to trial and things of that nature. And so um, I wanted to be a part of an organization that shared the same morals and values, and that was going to really help me long term. And um, TC Dip did that all summer. And so uh, the professional development, things that you spoke about, Liz, um, those were happening every week. I was assigned a mentor that I still keep in contact with. And so it was it was the mentorship for me. Uh, Stephanie. Um, 
kind of similar. I think my reasons for applying to the DC to 1L clerkship were similar to what Casey and Mason touched upon. Um, I didn't really have any lawyers in my family and I didn't really quite know, you know, what I wanted to do. I don't want an opportunity to explore, but also um, mentorship and guidance along the way. And it seemed like a really great opportunity to um, to get experience at a law firm, especially in your 1L summer, which isn't as common, um, and then get some of those meaningful opportunities and more importantly, make some connections and um, find mentors who speak a more or less of your language and can help you along your way in developing your career. So in combination of those factors, I think, um, attracted me to applying to the TC DIP clerkship. And I did really find it to be a really great program and great introduction to what it really meant to be a lawyer in private practice, I think, for my first year, um, first summer out of law school. And Matthew, I'll go ahead and um, ask the same question as you as well, but I'll also pitch this question um, from the Q&A to you, um, which is, what would you advise a 1L without any legal professional letters of recommendation? Um, how would you advise them to proceed with their application, since some of the positions do require one or two letters of recommendation, um, since you have uh, maybe some more experience on that hiring side of things as a shareholder? Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I should I should have mentioned I I run the summer program at Winter and Weinstein, and and me and two or two of my colleagues and I um, are responsible for the the TC dip hiring and some other diversity hiring we do, and then the summer program more generally. Um, so I, I want to first address the first question and say I, I completely agree with all my counterparts um, in the answers and getting the experience, building your, your resume figuring out what the law is. I'm also a first generation law student, really just had no idea what the law was when I was applying for things. And the TC that program is great. And then it gives you, you know, a kind of a look behind the curtain in the law firm uh, on the corporate side and really helps you kind of shape your future. And I, I know personally, you know, my experience was fantastic on both ends, but push me more towards private practice where I, I am today. And I know others go into this experience and have the opposite and end up in-house. So it's, it's a great there. The other part of it is just the, the community. Um, there's something so, so, so amazing about the TC Dip community that to this day, 10 years later, I have the strongest relationships with members of my, what I call my class. So uh, Summers, 1L Summers from 10 years ago, we refer each other work now. My book of business, I would say, is probably half attributable to connections I made back then. Um, I have more mentors through TC Dip than I probably have my own firm. And so all these things are not necessarily something you're thinking about when you're pressing submit on your application, but it's the aftermath. And you, like me, will look back 10 years later and think, wow, those are the most important relationships I've forged. Um, so it's really important. With respect to letters of recommendation, um, for those positions, I, you know, I would ask, I would talk to professors, I would talk to um, folks who you think could give a meaningful recommendation for you, let them know what you're looking into, um, let them know, you know, generally kind of the types of attributes that you think you would want them to um, share about you. And I, I have found that, um, you know, some of us when we're law students, even young lawyers, we have this fear about like, quote unquote, bothering more senior people. Um, I love hearing from people as a shareholder. I know professors love hearing from students. And I think, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with asking. And I think you'd be surprised how often the answer is the one you want. So you would say, you know, even if a person doesn't have a prior legal job, specifically like a legal paid job, that a letter of recommendation from a professor could stand in for that um, professional letter of recommendation? Yeah, I would say so. I would say for the for the most part, if there's a requirement that there is a recommendation letter presented and you don't have the ability to present one from a prior legal job, um, filling that gap with something else would go a long way as opposed to just leaving it empty. So a professor or maybe a non-legal prior job, but you want to present something where you're you know, filling the requirement, but also giving uh, the potential employer a, a look at your attributes. Great. Um, another question, and this is uh, probably for Mason and Casey, since you uh, were part of the program a little bit more recently, um, but what was something that you did with your application process to try to make your application stand out? Uh, Casey, let's start with you. Okay. Um, so I would 
say two really big things. Um, one was proofread, proofread, proofread. Um, I, I can't stress that enough. In addition to applying early, I apply really early um, or maybe three things. Um, but I attended an informational just like this and I felt really connected to one of the alumni um, and I still keep in contact with her. Her name is Samia. Um, because again, like I said, I didn't want to assume that I knew anything. I wanted to put my pride to the side um, and share with a TC Dip alumni who had already done this. Um, my interview style, I wanted to share, um, you know, my concerns about applications. And so Samia gave me some really great advice on how to market myself. Um, the, you know, social media is huge. And so we gravitate towards those pages that, you know, have really pretty color schemes and nice, pretty pictures. And so when you're thinking about packaging yourself, even if you have the best grades, even if you have um, a really great resume or really great letters of recommendation, I think the way that you package yourself and the way that you tell your own story is very important. Um, and so, like I said, I put my pride to the side and I connected with Samia right after this, uh, right after the informational last year and then proofread 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 I think I applied to almost every uh, firm that TC Dip offered minus the ones that required me to be in the 10% because I missed that part in law school my one nil year and so I applied to all of them but I think some way, somewhere in the middle, I started to get a little bit comfortable and I'll never forget I applied to Larson King and I spelled Larson King wrong and when I look back at that application, I was just like, yeah, definitely not getting that job because if I don't know how to spell Larson King, I shouldn't be working there. <laughs> and so that was a mistake that I caught. Of course, they sent me an email and said, no, thank you. You know that they were going to go in a different direction. But that's just an example of how important it is to, to proofread your applications, take your time apply early and put your pride to the side and call someone and get someone on the phone to make sure that you're packaging yourself very well. Yeah, I would definitely like to reiterate what Casey said about proofreading. Definitely proofread it over and over again. Even if you think there's it's perfect, there's usually some small error. Like I think I missed a couple of periods during one proofread pass and I thought it was perfect. I'll rely a lot on your career center. I know at least that the University of Minnesota our career center has been a really big help for me and others in getting our application materials together, making sure they're in the right format and proofreading them to make sure that we're hitting all the main points we need to be. And then also I'd like to say for interviews, especially do a lot of research about both the firm and the individual you'll be interviewing with. I know I probably spent hours, uh, in total, each individual person you're interviewing with probably doesn't require hours of research. Just seeing what type of work they did, what areas they're interested in, and really what are some of the main cases or things that they have on their firm profile. So you can really bring those things up and ask about them to try to make that connection a bit deeper and try to find some common ground where you can really talk to them about. And a lot of the interviews go quick, so finding something to make yourself stick out during that can be really useful. Um, and I have another question uh, from the audience about our internship decisions based on your first semester grades or first year grades. Um, and I can provide a little bit of insight into this in that um, most of the law firms do ask for first semester transcripts. Um, they won't have an opportunity to get your second semester first year transcripts um, as those will you know, not be available until the end of May. And at that point they will have already made their hiring decisions. Um, however, I will also say, and Stephanie and Matt can provide a little bit more insight into this, that um, our recruiting professionals really do take the application process seriously and they do take into consideration the entire application. And so while grades may be incredibly important and some firms do place a lot of importance on grades, there are also um, a lot of recruiting professionals that recognize that, you know, it's, it's one semester of grades and that semester um, may be, you know, extremely difficult for many people. Um, Stephanie, I know you've been involved in some hiring. Do you wanna elaborate a little bit more on this? Yeah, um, I mean, Liz is absolutely right. The grades are important, but don't, don't feel like you're being held back just because you had one semester, your first ever semester of law school that did not go quite the way that you planned. You know, but you just want to make sure that you're being attentive um, to every 
other part of your application package and paying attention to the details and making sure that you're presenting like what Casey alluded to, like the best possible version of you, including, you know, making sure you're spelling everything correctly, no typos, no grammatical errors, um, all, all of that. Um, and then I think the cover letter is also kind of a good, it's a good opportunity to present yourself a little bit and provide a little bit of explanation or background um, to advocate for yourself beyond just, you know, the standard grades, the resume and all that, right, in law school credentials. Um, so I think that's pretty helpful. I remember I, um, you know, make sure you have a little bit of put a little bit of personal touch to it. Um, short, very brief, like one or two sentences why you're interested in that particular um, law firm or law firm corporate partnership. And then if you're from out of state, you know, why you're interested in working in Minnesota for the longer term and why you're interested in this program. I think those also go a very long way. Um, but that being said, you are a law student, you are a student, right? Um, and so your grades are, you know, for better, for worse, an important factor of the application process. Um, and then also um, for the firms that do consider um, whether or not to give you a return offer for your 2L summer, they do ask, they tend to ask for your full year's worth of grades after your summer is over. So they ask for your spring semester grades. Yeah, I think um, just to add to that, I think there, there's so much good advice that's just been shared in the past couple of minutes here. So I don't have a ton to add to it, but I, I could not agree more that if first semester doesn't go the way you hoped or planned, do not let that discourage you from applying to this or anything else. Um, first semester grades, they matter, but they are the least important semester of all the semesters. The thing that matters most, if you don't, if you don't knock it out of the park, because law school is new to everybody, right? And it's for me at least, it was four classes, three hours, four tests, and you get a number. And you're like, wow, that was so different than undergrad. And that was so, and I wasn't used to this. And then it's, you know, how do you react to that? And maybe, you know, the next semester you improve dramatically. And that will say a lot more about you as a person, you as a potential lawyer than, you know, what you got there. So apply, apply, apply. The second part of that is if, if the GPA is not, and I work at one of the biggest firms in the Twin Cities, and we have hired 1Ls and 2Ls who had GPAs that start with twos because it's it is important, but it's also not the only defining thing about that person. And so if your number is not what you want it to be, really listen to the advice that's been shared by my counterparts on this panel about, you know, proofing and mock interviews and really showing that you are more than just that, you know, couple weeks in the end of December when you're stressed and tired and trying to figure out this brand new thing and really round yourself out so that when the firm or the people are having discussions, they can say, yeah, there was this little slip, but I'm this person did such a nice job and put so much time into this, came into the interview prepared, asked thoughtful questions, knew what I did, knew what my firm did, didn't send in a cover letter that said, I'm interested in your firm because I like the Twin Cities, period, <laughs> you know, sign, you know, really do those extra things. Um, and don't let that one little number discourage you, so. Um, another question uh, from the audience, how important is the legal writing sample? And I'll build on this question a little bit. Um, and is there anything that students should do to make their legal writing sample stand out? Um, I'll go ahead and start with um, Stephanie, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um... I would say it depends from um, from the firm and whoever is reviewing your application materials. Um, but the writing sample, you know, I, I would say have a second um, pair of eyes look at it. Um, I think the most important is that it's you're showing attention to detail. Again, I know we're I think we're being pretty repetitive about that, but like anything like typos, spelling errors, they should be free of that because that's the one chance that you get to show that you're, you know, like this is these are basic you know, things that you're not, you don't have to, you know, like as a law student, you should be able to provide a um, error-free written product, right? And so that says a lot about who you are and, you know, for better, for worse, like what type of work product you might be putting together as a uh, summer associate and in the future as a, an attorney. Um, so I think those are things that it, it's more of a, one of those like Nick, you know, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, you know, like it's, if you, it's one of these things where like, it's very noticeable if you didn't put in the effort and if there are those types of errors, right, in your written product, whereas if there aren't, you know, um, you know, it's a great, you know, it, 
there are other factors to consider in your um, in evaluating your writing sample, but I think those are probably the things that stand out. Because I mean, from the hiring side, people are reviewing a lot of um, applications, and you're not really spending more than maybe like max five minutes looking at probably each you know component of your application. So I think the things that are obvious stand out more than some you know maybe the substantive content and things like that. If that makes sense. I don't know if Matthew, if you have more to elaborate on that. Yeah, I, you know, I would agree completely. Um, I, I would say be thoughtful in, in the, the piece you submit. And again, to belabor it, you know, detail, detail, detail. Um, if you submit a 35 page memorandum, McDonald Douglas burden shifting analysis, I'm not reading the whole thing. <laughs> so like, you know, really maybe selecting an excerpt. One thing I love to see is in the cover letters, when you're saying, you know, attached as requested is a writing sample and then just a sentence or two on why it was important to you. This is from my first year writing. I found it so interesting because X, my professor inspired me because Y, I found this really challenging and I overcame this opportunity because, you know, ABC. Um, so using the opportunity, knowing that a, you know, busy law firm professional is not going to sit down and read the entire thing like your professor probably did. And just to add a little more about yourself, you know, this has got me interested in your firm because blah, 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 blah. So trying to do it that way also. Um, and I would say if your professor has given you feedback on the writing sample, incorporate that feedback before you um, send it out. This is an opportunity to improve on um, whatever you submitted for that class and really polish it before you uh, send it off to um, an application. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, ask a question for the whole group. Um, what was one of the most unexpected benefits of the TCCF 1L clerkship program? Um, and I'll start with Casey. Uh, one of the unexpected benefits for me, um, because I was doing the 1L clerkship in a pandemic, um, unfortunately, firms have to cut costs. And so typically you would come in with a cohort of other 1Ls um, who's also doing the clerkship program with you. And so at my firm, I was the only summer. And so I didn't have like other, you know, 1L uh, clerks to like proof my reading before I gave it to a partner or, you know, things like that. And so I was just so nervous whenever it was time to like submit an assignment. But the attorneys who had just previously gotten hired, they were so willing to help me. Um, there were uh, a lot of older partners who um, really graded my work and they gave me a lot of feedback, which again, a part of those horror stories you hear is that partners are so busy. I almost hate that word. It's like everyone has something on their plate, but it's like, you know, like, oh, everyone is so busy. Like, don't go and knock on their doors. But at Mayor and Gear, I found the exact opposite. Um, those attorneys that you see on LinkedIn getting those, you know, super lawyer awards and they're recognized all over Minnesota. Those were the guys that sat down and gave me the really good feedback. And so um, I think that was unexpected. I think that's one of the things that you don't hear, that they're so busy that they'll never help you. And that wasn't true. There was an attorney who sat down, who helped me. And I actually sent a letter to a client that like left the firm and I had put it together. And I was just genuinely shocked because I didn't think that as a 1L, I would get an assignment like that. And so just echoing what Matthew said earlier, um, there's this innate fear when you go and speak to, you know, just upper management and knocking on those doors of those partners, but you will be surprised that um, they do want to help you and they really do want to give you feedback because they've been doing this longer than we've been alive. And so they do want to help us. Uh, Mason. Yeah, along a similar vein as Casey, I would say one of the most unexpected things for me was just the access to people in general, uh, both through TCDIP and just through my firm. I think everybody who I reached out to, to just talk with or grab a virtual coffee with over the summer responded to me very quickly and was eager to set something up. But at least for me, it wasn't just people within my firm's office in Minneapolis, but people throughout the entire firm nationwide. I was talking with people from New York, DC, just on a daily basis, I could reach out to anybody in the firm. And within the week, I was talking with them, just discussing either their work or their balance with life and work balance. And just anything that they had an interest in that I was eager to talk to them about. 
and how they were to just tell me about anything and really get me involved both with those coffees and also invite me to go to meetings with them or just work on random assignments for them. And just having that access to such a large community of people really made it feel more like a home and a community rather than just a workplace. Stephanie. Um, I would probably say similar to what Mason and Casey touched upon again, um, what really surprised me, I was also the only summer associate at um, Fox Rothschild for that year. It was, the firm had just merged with the, it was a local firm, I think, and it had just merged with the larger um, firm at that time. Um, but everyone was really, you know, the attorneys from both associates to the partner level, I mean, they were all very open and enthusiastic and they would invite me to um, both meetings during the workday, but also to events, for example, if they had an extra you know, ticket for a baseball game or something or some charity event, they'd be like, oh, hey, we have this. Would you be interested in coming along? And me being a scared, you know, <laughs> what else summer, right? I was like, of course. But I mean, I really appreciated the, those, um, the thoughtfulness and those offers. Um, it, it provided the opportunities to get to know um, the people I was working with a lot better and also just to pick their brains and learn a bit, learn a little bit more about the legal profession and in, in the Twin Cities community. And then um, in terms of um, the attorneys providing feedback on my work too, that also was a pleasant surprise in terms of them, you know, stopping by my office, asking if I have a couple minutes and then really taking the time to like look at their edits they print it out on paper and then walk through you know the changes and explaining to me you know why um you know this is something that they think i could work on and why this component seemed like it was really you know promising and something you know a strength to keep in mind things like that so i thought that was really helpful because for most of the time you know i wasn't quite i didn't know what i was doing right i split between litigation and corporate work and at least the litigation part was you know, mildly familiar in terms of doing, you know, Westlaw legal research and writing and putting together memos for that. But then on the corporate side, I just, I had no idea what I was doing with the deal sheets and all that. So that was very, that was really helpful. And I really appreciated everyone's time and enthusiasm to help me um, feel like I was, you know, getting a valuable um, opportunity and experience that summer. Yeah, and I would um, I would echo everything that has been said about the experience itself. I will look at it from the lens of you know a decade later, and the thing that continues to surprise me the most is just the sense of community that has been created through my time with the TC Dip One L program and over the past decade. And you know, I think I mentioned I you know I'm from St. Louis Park, but I was gone for undergrad in Boston for four years and worked for a couple of years and law school in Chicago. I was gone for almost nine years or so. And I come back to the Twin Cities, I don't really have that like professional uh, community. And I really don't have, you know, I don't have a dad who had a country club and the guy next to him in the locker room is going to give me a bunch of work. This doesn't happen that way for, for me and a lot of people kind of uh, diverse attorneys. And so creating the sense of community, both with my, you know, one out class, but also the connections I made by going to TC at meetings, the mentors, and how that has lasted and grown and fostered over the past 10 years to now, as I mentioned previously, we refer each other work, people have popped around from law firm to in house, um, you know, I refer work out and it's just amazing this, this sense of community amongst diverse attorneys where everyone is rooting for each other and literally everyone will do anything they can for you. And then when that happens to you, you want to do it back for them and the people after you and things like that. So that's been surprising and rewarding and, and the thing I probably love most about the program. Um, and another question from the audience, how, if at all, did your work with the firm and the corporate partner differ? Um, Mason, I'll go ahead and start with you. For me, at least, the work at the corporate partner was a lot slower paced, it felt like. At the law firm, things constantly had deadlines and you always kind of had a vision of like when you need to have things done by and who you had to provide it to. Whereas with the corporate partner, I kind of was given one larger assignment for the duration of my time with them. And then it was a lot more of just kind of shadowing people in meetings and kind of going along, felt more like following along in someone else's day of their work in a corporate partner, rather than wearing in the law firm, it kind of more mirrored, probably a lighter workload version of what you would actually be doing as a first year associate. 
Casey. Yeah, uh, same, Mason. Um, I had spent eight weeks with the firm and I spent two weeks with the corporate partner. And from my experience, uh, with the corporate partner, you are preventing fires, right? And so you're, you know, working with um, everyone on your team to, you know, put systems and things in place to prevent fires. Whereas at the firm, a fire has already emerged and it's already ablaze. And your job is to put it out um, as the lawyer. And so um, I enjoy both. You know, I. I feel like I came to law school because of private practice and, and that's what you see and that's what you fall in love with. Um, but the corporate partner really piqued the interest that I didn't know that I had um, to just work with one entity for a really long time and build a lot of relationships. Um, I felt that there was a lot of value in that. And like Mason mentioned, just having a slower work pace, um, thinking long term because I'm not a traditional law school student. Um, I was a paralegal at Robbins Kaplan before uh, going to law school. And so um, just thinking about, you know, work life balance and, you know, things up the road, the corporate entity really piqued my interest. And so they differ a lot, um, but I really enjoy both. And so I think as a 1L, um, keeping your options open, um, bringing the same amount of energy to both, you might be pleasantly surprised in which one you ultimately decide to uh, work in after law school. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pitch, um, you know, an, an advertising question, but what is one of your favorite things about working and living in the Twin Cities. Um, Stephanie, I'll go ahead and start with you. Sure. Um, I mean, today is all negative degrees, so it's, <laughs> it's a little difficult today, but um, I would say um, generally one of my favorite things is um, there's a lot to do. I think I live very close to downtown Minneapolis, and so, um, you know, at least pre-pandemic, um, you know, I would go out to restaurants a lot, especially in the summers after work. And it just, it's really fun. It's a great way to get to know more people and um, do a lot of different things. I enjoy, you know, I enjoy the arts. There's a good art cultural scene. Um, you know, do you, I'm walking distance to museums, things like that. So, um, you know, I, I think there's a good balance of being in a, um, having, what a larger city would offer, but also being in a more um, manageable, living in a more manageable kind of pace, right? In terms of, you know, work is, I would say, I think work life balance compared to some of my peers who are in um, uh, New York City and um, San Francisco, it's a lot more manageable. Um, cost of living is a lot better too. Um, and I feel like I'm, I don't know, like marketing or I'm making a pitch for the Twin Cities and everything, but I think Liz set me up for that. So um, I don't know. I think it's a really great mix of just being in a um, being in a good place with a lot to offer. If that makes sense. Matthew. Yeah, I I would echo that entirely. Um, specifically, the the second half, the the Twin Cities, and again, this is something that I didn't really know coming, but looking back in the past ten years, I, I very much learned. I, I sound like a broken record, but the community, and I'll, I'll broaden it up to kind of the legal community generally, both the bench and the bar. Um, it, it, in my opinion, the Twin Cities is just the best place to practice for a bunch of reasons uh, that were just shared. Um, the, the time commitment, you know, we're lawyers, we work a lot, but compared to either coast where a lot of my uh, classmates went, it, it is a manageable amount. You know, again, you're going to work hard, you're going to be a lawyer, you'll have some late nights, but there is a work-life balance we get in the Twin Cities uh, that I personally need to thrive as a, as a human being, let, let alone a lawyer. Um, the other thing is the sophistication of work is, is amazing. You know, we are blessed with all of these, you know, Fortune 500, 200, 150 companies in town. And a lot of those companies have, have realized and know that, that we have terrific law firms in the Twin Cities. And a lot of that work obviously gets funneled to local law firms. So we both on the litigation side and the corporate side, have the ability to work on these cutting edge, sophisticated, really interesting matters for you know local or regional companies that you don't get everywhere. So we're not repossessing tractors in the middle of nowhere to have our work-life balance. We're doing really cool work. We're getting compensated really well. Um, we have you know a more affordable cost of living. It's, it's just an awesome place uh, to, to be a lawyer generally, I would say. 
Um, Casey. Yes, I, I agree um, with everything that Stephanie and Matthew said. Um, I would just like to add um, that again, as a minority law school student um, and future lawyer, that um, the minority community is growing. Um, it's no secret that you know there's not a large uh, population of African Americans in Minnesota. However, we are coming to Minnesota, and um, I'm just so excited because since the community is so small, it's not hard to touch the African American leaders that's in Minnesota. Um, for example, I applied for an externship with Keith Ellison, the um, attorney general here, and I interviewed and through a round of interviews, I got that job. And so for my other colleagues in law school who may be in bigger places like Matthew and Stephanie mentioned, you may never be able to touch those people. You may never be able to work at some of the, you know, renowned firms in New York, but because the um, minority community, like I mentioned, is growing, um, when you begin to build relationships through TC Dip, um, whoever you are assigned a mentor, continue to work with them, um, go to those networking lunches and uh, happy hours, and you will be surprised where you could potentially end up um, your 2 l summer or, you know, 2 l externships and, and things about that nature. And so, um, again, like I said, just echoing everything that everyone said, um, the minority community is growing. I think that there is a place for Black women and for Black men in Minnesota. And, um, and we're continuing to grow. Mason. Yeah, I think for me, my favorite thing about the city so far has just been the access to nature that provides, especially during the summer, you're so close to the Mississippi River and all the lakes that Minnesota has to offer. It's very easy to just take a quick trip down, go spend time with friends or family and just enjoy the nature and the weather. And even winter, although, it is very rough, especially for me being from California. Uh, just the nature of the people and the attitude of really trying to make the most of it that I've seen, whether it's going ice skating or hitting snowboard and skiing slopes, there's always something you can be doing in nature, even if it's negative degrees outside and people really try to make the most of it. It's great to see. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, it was really great to have all of you here um, sharing your insight. Um, and for any of you who are on uh, the Zoom, um, again, if you have any questions for me, feel free to reach out. I'll go ahead and put my email address in the chat as well. Um, and uh, if you have any questions about your application process or about um, the Twin Cities legal community in general, please do feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, Casey Stewart also put her email address in there, um, and I might give uh, others the opportunity to do so if they choose. Um, but thank you all so much uh, for joining today. Thank you so much.